Welcome to Bring the World Home, a production of the Return Peace Corps Volunteers of Hawaii. My name is Linda Chalk, and I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Northern Mariana Islands of Micronesia from 1966 to 1968. I will be the host for today's program. In this program, we will be sharing with you one Peace Corps volunteer's experiences from abroad. Hopefully, our messages of friendship and family with peoples of all countries and cultures are exhibited in each of our shows. Today's guest with me here is Sarah Yap, who served in Morocco from 2003 to 2005. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much. Sarah, can you show us on our globe here where Morocco is? Well, where? I am my journey here in Hawaii and Morocco is on the northwestern side of North Africa. Um, it's right below Spain and the Strait of Gibraltar goes to the northern part of it. It borders Algeria and Mauritania. So I was in a town called Zagora which is in the Sahara region of Morocco. Okay. Tell us a little bit about Morocco, um, how large it was. Mm -hmm. Um, Morocco is about the size of California, and the climate system is like California. There, there are beaches, there's desert, there are mountain ranges. ranges. Um, the population is about 32 million. So uh, it's made of, uh, the first people who, who lived there were Berbers, and later on Arabs came, and now both groups coexist, and the languages are Berber. There are three types of Berber, and they live in the northern, middle, and the southern region of the country. I see. And also French and Arabic are spoken. I see. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to join the Peace Corps? Well, my brother was a Peace Corps volunteer. He served in, in Micronesia. Mm -hmm. uh, I also was interested in pursuing something that was abroad, because I had studied abroad during college. And I remember as a child watching my sister and brother travel abroad, and I was always really jealous. So I finally had my opportunity, and the government was going to pay for it. And um, I studied international relations, so that was an interest as well. That's good. And I was also interested in Arab culture, because I had visited Tunisia uh, during my under undergraduate experience. And truthfully, I had a very difficult and challenging experience there, and I had a feeling that there was more to it than being harassed. And reading about a lot of negative media that we get in the United States. and so. It was a curiosity that I had, and so I decided to join the Peace Corps. And the, the match with what I did was perfect for what I studied, because it, there was an opening for doing marketing and working with artisans, and I double mm. majored in art as well. And so I decided to go there, and it was, it was just the fit. That's great. Um, tell us about the training you had to prepare you for your assignments in Morocco. Well, prior, um, I've heard that Peace Corps volunteers often did training in the United States. However, our program was different, and I think it's becoming more common to have training in the country itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Moroccan Arabic is a very unique type of Ar Arabic that's not, not many people in the United States speak as opposed to classical Arabic. And so um, the program has existed in Morocco since the 60s. And so we had... Um, uh, language training in community-based training sites. Mm -hmm. So I lived in a town called Sefro, which is about half an hour from Fez, which is in, in the middle region of Morocco. So we had language training and also cultural training, which entailed living with a host family. So I lived with about three or four host families prior to moving to Zagora. And we also had health training, which um, an example would be we used Buddha gas burners, which are um, tanks, how they use their, their gas to heat their stoves, and safety precautions on that, as well as basic medical training, like um, health, how to, how to cure a common cold, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and also on the job training with um, doing marketing analysis and working with artists in the community so we can get practice interacting with the host country yeah. nationals. Oh, I see. And your training took place over a period of about three months? It was so? about two and a half months, three months, correct. Okay. Yeah. And then you went to your assigned area, you said Zagora? Yes. So Zagora is a town um, 
the town is famous. If you look in a guidebook, it's, it's called, there's a sign that says 52 days to Timbuktu. And Zagora was the trading post for people who would go through the Sahara Desert and come out and they trade gold or spices. Um, so my town survives on no longer really trading, but more working on oases or farming agriculture. Uh -huh. yes. And so that's an important aspect of Morocco, as well as phosphate. That's the number one um, source for its um, income in the mm -hmm. country. They export. Okay. Yeah, they export it. Okay. Right. The oasis are something quite interesting because you always hear about the oasis in the desert. Yeah. And from some of the pictures you have, um, you can see the lush palm areas uh, along the river. Right. I lived in the Dra Valley, um, and that the Dra meant um, it was a measurement of of land because when the Jews were living there, they didn't have a, a form of measurement, and so they would measure with their arms. Oh. And so that's how my my valley was named. And it's when you drive into it, it looks like the moon or Mars, and suddenly you see an explosion of green, and it's just all these oases that pop up, and the water comes from underground, and people. Um, have a lot of date farming and mm -hmm. so people's lives revolve around this type of farming also vegetables but people make crafts such as baskets and they sell their dates I so see. the region is surviving through these oases mm -hmm. interesting um, tell us a little bit about your assignment um, in Zagora I was a small business volunteer and our primary goal was to work with artisans in the area who were interested in marketing their products or doing product development. Mm -hmm. um, so in my town there was no artisan cooperative and we're thinking about starting an association to gather the artisans in the area. However, at times it was pretty difficult because um, there are so many different types of artisans. So I worked, I decided to focus more on working with women artisans. Mm -hmm. If men wanted help, I'd help them too. I wasn't <laughs> selective like that. But the women especially wanted help in and learning about color, design, um, oh. advertising, mm -hmm. even language. I taught English as well. And from there, when you have your primary project, you can also do secondary projects. I see. And so I started doing things like um, doing a running club, working with children, and we also had a solar oven, cook oven cooking. Oh, that sounds interesting for an area right above the Sahara Desert. Yeah. Yes, it was perfect because of the amount of sun it gets and also um, the, p the women have to make bread every single day, and they spend a huge amount of time in the kitchen. Okay. Um, so the advantage of the solar oven was that they could just leave the food on the roof and then come down and do other projects, maybe doing arts and crafts. And also it was a, an, a, an income generation type of project mm -hmm. where they could copy the, the oven and teach other women how to do it. So these ovens were um, very easy to construct, or did you? Yeah, all you needed you uh, was a cardboard box, aluminum foil. You paint the, you glue the pieces together, and then you have a pot and you put the the food on top of it, and it's shaped sort of like, mm, like an L. Mm -hmm. And you put it in a plastic bag and it cooks. Oh, I see. And it's slow cooking, but there are a lot of things you can do to fill the time, like talk and play with sheep or ride donkeys or just learn about the culture. A lot of people played instruments too. So oh, okay. It's totally out of my element, but you just get used to it, and you think this is completely normal after a while, which is fun. Yeah. What what types of food did they have there that you were cooking? Um, well, one of the most famous dishes in Morocco is the couscous because the way that they make it is very unique. Um, growing up here, my mother would make couscous, but she did it the wrong way. She would take the couscous and add hot water to it, and then stir it up. And a lot. I grew up not really having an affinity for it. However, in Morocco, what they do, it's a steaming method, sort of like how Chinese steam dumplings or manapua. And um, every Friday after the call to prayer around lunchtime, it always changes because it depends on moonrise, sunrise. Mm -hmm. um, people would finish praying, come home from the mosque, and we'd all gather around a table and partake. Oh, like a family or like a community. Family. And this is such an important element of the country. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things was being able to eat with my hands. Because all my life, I've been uh, reprimanded for it. But here, you have simply to wash your hands, which the host does for you. And you partake in it, either by rolling the balls with the women who seem to eat more with their hands, 
Or you can use a spoon, and a lot of times it's so hot you can't handle it, but if you're yeah. tough, you use it. So yeah. this is one of my favorite dishes, and also the tagine. No, couscous is made of wheat? It's or made what? from, um, it's, I believe it's, uh, it comes from its corn grain, but uh -huh. I could be wrong about that. Um, and that's the base, and in top, on top you put sort of like a stew. Okay. And it takes about three or four hours to make. And what kind of meat do they use in the stew? Um, primarily, well, you can, it ranges. There's beef or lamb uh -huh. or chicken. And my favorite is lamb because that's what they have a lot of, and it's very moist. Um, and there are different types that you make and certain types that you make for certain occasions. For example, in Eid al-Adha, mm -hmm. which is when they slaughtered the lamb to reenact what Abraham did during, uh -huh. um, in the Bible or the Quran, mm -hmm. they do this, they slaughter the lamb, and then they use that lamb in the couscous and they also eat the liver and there's a whole ritual that you oh. do before you um, you kill the animal you say bismillah mm -hmm. which means um, in the name of God and you slaughter the lamb and then you prepare the, the dish and you partake with it with your whole family so it's almost like a, a tribute to their God exactly at the same time that right. they're preparing for and the, the feast. whole country <laughs> slaughters a sheep if they can afford it mm -hmm. if there are limited amounts of sheep then the king slaughters one, I and it's see. a sacrifice for the whole country as well. Mm -hmm. They go through a fasting period before the the actual right. feast, though, right? This is um, and this this is called Ramadan, and yes. and that's also an interesting time. And I tried to fast, and I made, I tried for about twenty one days, <laughs> and it really made me appreciate what <laughs> Muslims can do. Well, what do you mean by fasting? You have a limited intake of. Wa water, you're alive. Right, you cannot drink water, you cannot eat anything, you cannot smoke. Um, these things are not allowed once um, when the sun is up. However, when the sun goes down, then you can do this. And once morning begins, and you know it's morning, it says mm -hmm. in the Quran that when you can distinguish a white thread from a black thread just by the colors, then you know that it's morning and then I you see. have to begin the fast again. I see. But it's a very tough time, especially for taxi drivers, because of the, nico the nicotine, oh. they go crazy. And everyone is very edgy. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the day, you have futur, which is the meal that breaks the fast. Mm -hmm. And it's like Christmas every day. Wow. But a lot of people get yeah. out before the break, and they run or do something, and then they come back to their family. I see. So during this fi festival or fast, um, mm -hmm. after the fast, they have special foods that they, yes, um, they share do. with the community or their families? Mm -hmm. So the food that is most symbolic is the date. Oh, Because okay. um, Muhammad the prophet ate the date when he was, he was doing, doing his, his, um, meditation. his meditation. And they use that as a way to energize themselves before they partake in this meal yeah. so that I guess they don't pass out or it's just also a very symbolic food. And their foods call them there's milawi, which is sort of like a crepe. Mm -hmm. There's bagarir, which is like a pancake, but there are more holes in it because of yeast. And there's the most important soup is harira, and it has um, garbanzo beans in it and tomatoes and pasta and lentils, and it's a very protein-rich food so that mm -hmm. you can regain that energy and be but ready for the fast. all really vegetarian, but yeah, with lots of protein. Yeah, primarily vegetarian. Oh. But in the the suhoor, which is the, the dinner, mm -hmm. then you can have more meat. I see. But it's in the middle of the night, you'll be woken up by the call to prayer or by my host mother, and she'll be tapping on you and saying, come and eat, come and eat. And it'll be like 2 o'clock, and you'll be like, I can't eat. But you get up because you just want to be a part of this experience. I see. It's a very hospitable and warm culture. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go there. I didn't know that much about it. I had heard stories. Mm -hmm. But that's how they share their hospitality is through food. They sound like a very warm people. Um, very warm. W in the United States, we get the impression of, or we hear more of the Arab terrorism, you know. But your experience seems to show a different aspect of these people and their culture. This is true, and I, it also depends on what region you are. Being from the southern region where I'm not sure if it's climate or the influence of nomadic tribes when they would come in from the desert, they would be more hospitable to people who are traveling because they could understand how difficult it was. And so in my community, people were always inviting me. And I would joke with my mm -hmm. volunteer friends that you could go two months in that country without buying a, a, a meal because everyone's constantly saying, do you need food? You look hungry. Come and eat. Come and eat. 
So it, it's something that I really appreciate about Muslim countries is their hospitality and thinking of what the guests may be, be, may be needing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Your assignments sounded very interesting. You uh, focused on business development or uh, I focused teaching? on teaching and also um, uh, working with women who wanted to maybe open up a store of their own one day. I see. Because I asked them one time, what, what are your goals in life? Do you, do you want to open up your own business? And a lot of them had never maybe thought of it. Considered it. Considered it, it. Consider yeah. it because it's just, it's not a, a culture that enforces entrepreneurship. Especially or, for women. Especially for women or thinking outside of the box. Yeah. For example, changing a recipe. There's only a set way to make that couscous. Oh, interesting. And, and I would suggest things, and they'd be like, no, Sarah, you don't do it that way. <laughs> but they were always willing to try things that I wanted to make. Um, but yes, those were my primary projects with a women's association as well. Mm -hmm. I had a great um, counterpart was, who was sort of like a, a project manager. I see. And she did a lot with women's literacy programs. Oh. And sometimes I would attend them because they were in Arabic. Mm -hmm. And I would learn Arabic songs and prayers. Not practical everyday things that I need to know, but great for conversation pieces or right. even just learning more about the, this, this book that was so important. That's, it's so important to them. Mm -hmm. So y you taught English to the women um, as well. Is that right? Yes, I taught maybe about three times a week. And mm -hmm. it would be a range of things. Sometimes it would be about American culture, the differences between Morocco and America, mm -hmm. or um, health care. Um, a couple of times I brought in doctors to talk about AIDS education. Oh, I see. And it was a female doctor. And that was the first time they were put in this setting where they could speak with a doctor with a, a group of women and talk about health concerns or issues, mm -hmm. questions about their bodies. And it was an opportunity for them to also be more relaxed and out of their, their working, the condition of always working all the time, more mm -hmm. about their health and their family and their future. Mm -hmm. um, did you teach um, technical things like about computers or the, did, were you able to get on the World Wide Web? Um, yes, for um, for the first year, I was teaching a, a computer program class with uh, a volunteer who was from Canada. She mm -hmm. was doing a program called Alternative, and together we co-taught a class to artisans oh, doing yeah. how to do word processing, mm -hmm. how to create business cards, and we learned a lot from them too. For example, one student brought in locusts because we had a locust invasion, oh. and they cooked it. They fried it with salt and oil. And we had it during our tea time after class, and I've never eaten a locust before, but they taste like shrimp. So it was just, it was always a, a mutual type of interaction. However, I think I learned a lot more from them than I was able to give back, but we'll see about that. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering how, how important English would be as a subject to them. You know, how would they use that? Mm -hmm. Do they reach out to the world economy? with yeah. English or um, well you know. in my town it was there were about 20 hotels so it was a mildly it, oh, there I were see. tourists that would come uh -huh. but a lot of them were from Europe and so French was more essential yes however there w there are people who wanted to learn English for something to do for sometimes watching a, a program that was in English because they do have satellite television there. I see. Uh -huh. Almost every Moroccan has a television. They might not have a, a stable roof, but they have a satellite dish. <laughs> um, so they do have access to English. And I was amazed by how many store owners could speak eight languages without ever going to school. Really? And it was a, purely because of conversation and sitting down with people and interacting. Mm -hmm. And so I learned that language requirement is possible, not necessarily in a classroom setting, but interacting with people. Mm -hmm. You might not write it right necessarily, um, but dialogue is important. I think that's what one of their strengths is, is communication. I think they're very socially advanced. Mm -hmm. They're very comfortable with sitting down and talking. And whenever I would ride a train, people would always be passing out phone numbers, men and women, 
saying, if you ever are in this place, please know that you're welcome into my house with my family. Right, so you establish a network. Yeah, so it's very great. easy to have a network wow. in Morocco. So, they sound so friendly and open. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I felt safer there than I do in the United States. And some, there are incidents, incidences that happen, and you can say that about any country. Mm -hmm. For example, um, maybe anti-American sentiment, but that's very uncommon, at least for the places that I'd, I had visited. I see. Well, you were there when the U.S. was engaged in some um, hostilities, you know, yes. with Arabic countries. Did you ever fear for your own security? Um, we would get updates from our country director on uh -huh. being cautious. However, there was a group, the group that went before me was taken out of the country. And they lived in the United States trying to figure out what to do after that. Mm -hmm. But my group was the first group to return after that, and so they were extra cautious. Mm -hmm. But living in a small village, it's not very, I won't see the ramifications of that too much. There might be some ill feelings towards the United States, but people still look, they s still admire the United States, despite mm -hmm. what happens in I the see, Middle East. Yeah. It's an Amer interesting Morocco dynamic. has really been friendly to the U.S. government. Yes, there's a very good relationship between the countries. Yeah. In the few minutes we have left, I'd like to, to show the, um, our audience what you've brought back with you. Well, this is a tagine, and uh -huh. it's basically a, tagine is a... It's a conical ceramic dish that you can use to stew foods in. You leave it, you cut up potatoes or onions in oil and salt, and you mm -hmm. leave it in there for about an hour along with the meat. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the taste is even more rich because somehow the, the flavor is enhanced by the, the ceramic. And these are two mini tagines, not necessarily cooked on the stove, but maybe you'll make something and this will be a smaller way to present it. Mm -hmm. These are fibules, and this was the symbol of Zagora, and it's what the Berbers used mm -hmm. on a lot of their clothing, and it was for females. And the positioning of the fibules meant something like maybe they're not married or they're married, a way of signal signaling that maybe they would like to get married. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just another example right here. Mm -hmm. This is a basket that was made in my town by the women, and it's made out Beautiful. of the palm leaves of the date tree. And you can um, take off the skins of the garbanzo beans with it by rolling it, or you can make couscous and fluff it in here, and then you put it back onto the pot. Very useful. So. Okay. So do you think that the Peace Corps being in Morocco was really worthwhile for the U.S. government? I, I don't see how it couldn't be because it, in some way some type of understanding is being made, mm -hmm. and I think that's very important. Um, I also think that uh, that the program could change some things. It's especially challenging for, well, it's, it can be challenging as a female because of the the harassment levels. But I think it does help to be an American. Well. The relationship between the two countries, it's only, it's improved from my, my point of view. Right. We have just a couple of minutes left. Is there anything that you'd like to comment on or add? But Thankful for President Kennedy for thinking of this program, and I heard that it was created on a whim. Um, but I, I recommend visiting Morocco, or at least learning about it, because we get such a, a we're, a lot of the media distorts things. A and once you get one-sided view. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. once you get to know someone from that country, your perspective starts to change. And it's being a little bit curious that helps in asking questions. And I, I think that's one thing I did was, I did learn was through questioning people. Mm -hmm. You learn so much through it. So I appreciate that. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much, Sarah, thank you for very much coming well. and You're sharing your. Um, your experiences with us and some of the artifacts that you brought in. And I understand that you'll be heading back out in that direction soon. Yes, I'm, I'll be living in the Middle East, well, now in the Middle East, and in Damascus, Syria. I see. To learn oh. more about Arabic. Okay, and working with women in international studies? Yes, this will be on a fellowship okay. there. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the audience for watching Bring the World Home. And we hope that you'll join us again when we bring you another Peace Corps volunteers' experiences from abroad.